My grandfather sat in his rocking chair, holding his body rigid like that of a corpse. His eyes looked like those of an old dog. His lips constantly chattered, and his fingers trembled with the Parkinson's that was eating away at him like cancer. We both knew he didn't have long left. He looked at me with his strange yellow eyes and gave me a weak grin. Elias, I think I should tell you the story of my childhood, my grandfather said, a single tear rolling down his cheek. I will tell you of what happened to me when I was only 13 years old, when I was sent to Auschwitz with my father by my side. This is the story he told me, unbelievable as it is. Though my grandfather had been dead for years now, his story still stays with me to this day as an unbearable burden on my heart. I still remember the moment we arrived at the camp like it was yesterday. We were exhausted and starving. We had been on the cold cattle cars for five days and five nights, and we were given no food or water that entire time. Many of the sick and old died on the way. We moved their corpses to the corner of the car, and my father said Kadish over their corpses. It was the first time I saw the light of life extinguished from the eyes of so many in such a short time, but it would be for but it would be far from the last finally long after the night had come the doors to our cattle cars slid open pale starving creatures in stripped black and white rags stood around ss soldiers in black spotless uniforms they grinned as the death's head insignia in sharp lightning bolt ruins gleamed bright silver. The SS men all had vicious German shepherds who lunged at the frightened prisoners, gnashing and snapping at the air. I saw more than a few people get bit by the vicious dogs. They had deep bite wounds and chunks torn out of their flesh and we all learned to avoid the dogs and the SS men as much as possible after that. In the dark night, we were formed into lines. Old women held the hands of their small grandchildren. The sons tried to stay with their fathers. We moved forward. Up ahead, I saw a man in a black SS uniform whistling a tune from Wagner. I would later realize that this man was Dr. Menjel. I tried to stay with my father, but the surging crowds pulled us apart. I didn't know it at the time, but I would never see my father again. If I had known, would I have acted differently? Would I have told him how much I loved him? I'll never know. But his ashes rose up into the air later that night, and I saw it from the freezing barracks in that place of shadows. Someone behind me whispered in my ear, Boy, how old are you? Thirteen, I said, turning to look at the strange figure, a starving man in a striped uniform. The man shook his head. No, you're 16. When you get up there, remember that. You're not 13. You're 16. The man insisted. He was part of the prison commando that helped the SS with translating the many languages that streamed into the camp and also helped them organize the prisoners for slave labor or death. I would never see that starving man again, but I followed his advice. As I got up to Dr. Menjel, he stopped whistling just for a couple of seconds. The black cloudless sky hung heavy above us, the clouds of smoke rising up from the crematoria with the smell of burning hair and searing flesh. Dr. Mengel gave me a fatherly smile, but in his eyes, 
There was something as cold as frozen steel hiding just under the surface. I could see it. I could feel it in the air. I could almost smell it radiating off of his skin. It sent ice water racing through my veins. Hello, son, he said in a warm voice as he gave a faint smile. Though his eyes did not smile as I think back on it, neither did his mouth. What's your age? Sixteen, I said confidently, looking him straight in the eye. Any physical deformities? Any illnesses? He asked, the faint half-smile like a statue of Buddha still plastered across his lips. I shook my head. No, sir, I said. He nodded and pointed to the right. I didn't know if this was a good thing or a bad thing. I saw, to my growing horror, that most of the prisoners were going to the left, including all the elderly, all the children, anyone with disabilities, and anyone who looked too frail or emaciated. In all, about 90% of the line went to the left, and about 10% went to the right. Those who went to the left wouldn't live out the hour. They would be stripped naked, beaten and bludgeoned to force as many people into the gas chamber as possible. Then the heavy metal door would be sealed. The Zyklon B pellets would be dropped into a vat of sulfuric acid, and the vents would turn on, whirling like hornets, breathing their deadly poison into the concrete tomb. The screams in the chamber often went on for over 20 minutes. The corpses would be intertwined in pyramids, their arms and legs caught together like rats in a rat king. The cyanide gas prevented their lips and fingernails from turning blue and made the corpses look pink, almost healthy, except for their frozen, terrified death masks and sightless eyes. In 1944, while I was at Auschwitz-Birkenau, I was coming back late from a work detail in the nearby concrete factory with some other inmates. We passed through the freezing winds and whipping snow that bit like an ice pick into our bodies. There were open air pits that belched black smoke into the air constantly. What a world we lived in where the graveyards rose into the sky and the blackness of space descended in those below. That was the night when my faith in God finally died forever. As I would learn later, the SS had a recent shortage of Xylon B, the cyanide pellets used to exterminate masses of human beings and turning them into ashes and fetid reeking smoke. The advances of the Red Army had caused issues with delivering it, and a transport of children had just come into the camp. The SS men in the Kapos loaded these children, most of whom were no older than seven or eight, beating them with trenchants and kicking and punching them. When the crying, bloody children were finally all settled in on the back of the dump trucks, they had the drivers back them up towards the inferno of burning bodies. I watched, horrified, as they slowly angled the beds downwards. The children began sliding out with horrible, wretched screams. They fell into the pit of fire. I watched their hair burn, their skin blacken and sizzle. The drops of fat melt and drip off their screeching lips. Some of them tried to crawl out, but the black-clawed SS men went around with long sticks and pushed the half-dead, writhing children back into the scorching flames. My grandson, I tell you truthfully that this is what I saw with my own eyes, heard with my own ears, when I was only 13 years old. The screams of the burning children went on for 15 or 20 minutes. It felt like at the moment we stood in the center of the universe. God had died. 
He had murdered eternity and left us alone in this endless pit of suffering and death. There was no justice, I knew. And if God was real at all, then he was either evil or insane. The faraway stars of cold white light seemed to turn and look down on us, all of us, the living and the dead alike. The wind whipped past us, screaming with the voices of the damned. Sometimes late at night, I think I still hear those children screaming as their bodies burned and blackened. I think I still hear those children screaming as their bodies burned and blackened. It is any wonder then that I almost never slept, and when I do, is it any wonder then that I almost never sleep, and when I do, I wake up shrieking as mountains of pale burning corpses flash across my mind? One day during selection, I saw Dr. Mengel again. He looked me up and down and wrote something on a clipboard. Later that day, I was told by the capo that I would be moved to the medical ward. The medical ward? I asked, confused. Why? I'm not sick. The doctor requests your presence. The capo said sarcastically, giving me a little bow. He was a fat man with a face like a bulldog and red hands like a butcher. He loved to beat and rob the prisoners under him. Move, scum. Double time. Get your ass to the medical barracks. I didn't need to be told twice. I quickly scurried away, constantly glancing back to make sure no blows from his fat hands would run down my head. I wound my way through the bare wooden barracks that acted as our homes, the homes of walking skeletons of men whose bodies were frozen and dying. Within these barracks, we were often packed so tightly together on the hard wooden planks that one man couldn't turn to his right without every other in the row having to move. But when the freezing winter cold blew in, and we only had thin blankets and our black and white striped rags. The body heat from the others kept us from freezing to death, at least for some of the time. Corpses were taken out of the barracks every morning, prisoners who died from the cold, from hunger, from dysentery or disease, from beatings and murders and suicides. It was like a constant stream of death a waterfall of oblivion crashing forward. The corpses came, but the fire ate them all greedily and exhaled only fetid black smoke in response. I walked into the medical barracks, sat on the chair, waiting. I saw my friend from the work commando, Moshi. His dark, serious eyes stared through me, as if he didn't see me. He had a straight nose and high cheekbones on his aristocratic face, though he now looked as pale and starved as I did myself, no more than a bag of bones wrapped in skin and clawed in rags. Eliza? Mashi said, suddenly realizing I was there. Were you chosen for this too? I nodded grimly, not knowing what he was referring to but feeling in my heart it was nothing good. Nothing ever good came from this camp, after all. Nothing but reeking smoke and ashes came from it. Nothing but the hurricane of souls whipped away from the currents of the Zyklon B came from it. Do you know why we are here? I asked, fidgeting and nervous. I glanced around, seeing a clean, well-stocked medical room beyond a surgical table in the middle. There were bunks in the back of the medical barracks where the lucky ones would live. We even got increased rations of sawdust bread and watery soup. Dr. Mengel wants us, Mashi said simply, and his eyes looked through me again. His mind seemed to drift off far away from this world of suffering. My emaciated body was such a heavy thing. It felt like the weight of the entire universe was contained within my body. 
I despised that body. That starving, sickly thing that followed me like a shadow. I wanted to be free of it. To see the highest reality without a body. To see truth without the constant suffering and agony. The constant hunger and cold and beatings and the stench of death. But it wasn't to be. Dr. Mengel walked into the barracks a few minutes later, surrounded by female nurses clawed in white. He looked at me and Mashi. His cold blue eyes sparkled with intelligence. He always kept his black SS uniform perfectly cleaned and ironed. It gave an impression that some black knight from a lost tale of the Dark Ages had just wandered in. He held a clipboard in his hand. He glanced down at it, frowning. Then he spoke in clipped German. A9971 and A8991. You are hereby requested to participate in the medical experiment that will test the effects of certain drugs on the body. We do this under the authority of the Great German Reich and our Reichfahrer SS Himmler. You will stay here in the medical barracks until the experiment has ended, Dr. Mengel said. As soon as he was done, he walked briskly over to the dark room with a surgical table. He came back out with two syringes filled with some black fluid that shone with glittering rainbows. He came up to me first. A9971, your arm, Dr. Mengel demanded. I stretched out my arm. He applied a tourniquet. Then the vein throbbed like a fat worm. He plunged the needle inside and pressed down on the plunger. I felt something like lava ripping its way through my body as my breath caught in my throat. I thought it was choking and dying. My heartbeat was so fast in my chest that I feared it must explode. Dr. Mengel walked over to Moshi as my vision turned white. I groaned, my teeth chattering, and then I fell forward onto the wooden floor. I must have lost consciousness, because when I awoke, it was night in the medical barracks. I found myself laying on a bunk. A small serving of sawdust bread and thin, watery soup was laid down next to me. Still sleeping, I saw the form of Moshe, his face as pale as a skull. Moshe, I whispered, trying to push myself to my feet. My head throbbed. I looked down at my arm, seeing the spreading patch of blackened necrotic tissue spreading from the injected site. It almost looked like shiny scales were spreading across my skin. I looked down at Moshe's arm and saw the same dark patches there. Wake up, Moshe, please. I need you. I need someone. I can't do this alone. But in my heart, I knew that we were all born alone and we all died alone. Moshe couldn't help me with anything. Even God couldn't help me here. He didn't listen to our prayers or hear the Kadesh read for the dead. He had turned his face away from us and every dying heart there felt like great emptiness as the life was extinguished from their eyes. I shook Moshe gently, not wanting to scare him. His eyes flew open. He looked up at me, and I saw with horror that something was wrong. His eyes had become slitted and yellow, like the eyes of a serpent. He hissed at me. A thin stream of frothy blood bubbled from his throat as he gurgled, pushing himself up like a zombie. What happened to you? I asked in a panic, backpedaling away from the transformed Mache. He looked like a rabid animal, his eyes gleaming with insanity. He came at me, and his teeth looked longer, sharper, more predatory. They looked like fangs. He leapt off the bunk, soaring through the air towards me. As he gnashed his teeth, I frantically tried to push him away. His jaws snapped together with a crack like a bullwhip. 
He lunged forward and his bleached white face came down. I felt the skin on my face tear with the pain like fire spreading throughout my head. He bit on my cheek and ripped upwards, leaving a mutilated flap of skin hanging there. I felt something hot and poisonous coursing through my bloodstream, but unlike Moshe, I had not gone insane. I felt my teeth lengthening though, and my eyes abruptly adjusted to the dark. I could see every moat of dust floating through the air, see every spatter of blood on the swept wooden floor. A hiss tore its way out of my throat. My arm lunged forward, as if with a mind of its own. Sharp claws ripped their way out of the ends of my fingers as I threw Moshe off of me. He ran out into the night, hissing and wailing his forked tongue flicking out between his bloody lips. A few moments later, I heard SS men yelling at the nearby perimeter and their guns started firing. The banshee wail from Moshe grew louder, and the SS men screamed, their voices filled with panic and terror. I staggered out of the medical barracks, seeing Moshe clawing and biting at the black clawed form of an SS man. Two others laid dead. Two others laid dead next to him, their throats torn out, the mutilated flesh sliced wide open. Moshe leapt off of the dying SS man and loped towards the electrical fence. In horror and astonishment, I watched him swipe at it with his claws. It gave a loud pop of electricity and I saw a flash of blue light, but the black scales that now covered almost all of Moshe's skin only seemed to glow brighter, gleaming like obsidian. Moshe remained unaffected. He ripped a hole in the fence as it continued sizzling, leapt over the razor wire and disappeared off into the forests of Poland beyond. After a long moment staring at the bodies of the SS men, I ran forwards towards freedom as well, following the trail of Moshe. I still had my mind, however. Whatever poison Dr. Mengel had given us hadn't affected me like it had affected Moshe. But still, I noticed I was healing faster. The deep gash on my cheek stopped bleeding within minutes and a layer of thick black scales started to cover the wound. Over the next few weeks, I made my way towards Switzerland, where I spent the rest of the war. But I heard rumors of the forests of Poland, that there was a strange creature attacking isolated farms and houses. A creature with slitted eyes like a serpent's and black scales covering his deformed, twisted body. My grandfather stopped speaking suddenly, looking up at me with glazed eyes. Do you believe me, Elias? He asked. Do you believe what I've told you? I nodded. He pulled up his sleeves, and there, on his arms, I saw black scales covering his skin all the way to the wrists.